Good evening, and thank you for your patience. I'm Jean Greenwood, the program associate for the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, and we're just delighted that you're here tonight and so grateful that you're willing to bear with a few technical difficulties. We've solved them now, so we're ready to get started. We had trouble with some PowerPoint slides loading, but they'll be well worth your wait, and I'm very glad you've turned out for the second event in our series, Wealth and Poverty, Bridging the Divide. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Carly Adney, who will give a few introductory remarks before the panel begins. Thank you, Jean. Uh, welcome to Globalization, the Market Economy, and its Impact on Wisconsin. This panel discussion is the second event, as Jean said, in the Wealth and Poverty, Bridging the Divide series program year. This series is part of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, located on the UWMC campus and affiliated with the UW Colleges and the UW Extension, whose mission is to enhance the civic life of communities throughout Wisconsin with educational outreach, internships and service learning opportunities, public scholarship, nonpartisan public dialogue, and dissemination of ideas generated through research and programming. WIPS would like to acknowledge the generous financial support of the Wisconsin Humanities Council, the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin, Marathon County, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Kettering Foundation, the Alexander Foundation, the B.A. and Esther Greenheck Foundation, the UW UWMC Foundation, UW Colleges Offices and its Chancellor, and the WIPS inaugural donors. This panel discussion will explore how the confluence of open markets, pressure for increasing profits, and cheap overseas labor have conspired to change our economy. UWMC Professor of Economics, Hamid Milani, will introduce our distinguished guest speakers and will moderate the panel. After the panel discussion, a question and answer session will follow. Institute interns will circulate with handheld microphones so members of the audience may direct their questions to the panelists. Because this program is being viewed for and taped for viewing on public access television, we ask that audience members wait for a mic to be handed to them before they ask their question. And we ask that audience, audience members speak into the mic so that their questions may be recorded as part of the aired program. I would also like to invite all of you after the question and answer session concluding tonight's discussion to take a moment to fill out the evaluation forms you received upon entering the theater. Then drop these completed evaluation forms in the box by the theater exit. These surveys help us to track our programming efforts. You are all also invited to a reception in the terrace room right across the way where you will have a chance to mingle with the authors and share conversation, cookies, and punch. Now I'd like to hand it over to Professor Hamid Milani. He's been at UWMC for 24 years. He's published and presented widely in his primary research interest of international economics. Thank you. Good evening. We have an excellent program for you and we have three outstanding speakers. Uh, first one, Mike Knetter is the Dean of School of Business in Madison and also research associate for the National Bureau of Council, uh, Council of Economic Research and also faculty affiliate of the La Follette School of Public Affairs. Prior to joining the business school in 2002, he was the associate dean of the MBA program and professor of international economics at Dartmouth College. He's published extensively in the area of macroeconomics and international economics. He has also served as senior staff economist for President's Council of Economic Advisors for former President Bush and Bill Clinton. He has a BA from University of Wisconsin Eau Claire in economics and mathematics and PhD from uh, PhD in economics from Stanford University. Uh, Lee Hansen, our second speaker, 
is the professor emeritus of economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He taught in Madison campus for many, many years. Also, he, he taught at the University of California, Los Angeles before joining Madison. He served as senior staff economist for President's Council of Economic Advisors. I would assume that was during Johnson administration? Yeah. Johnson administration. And uh, he's also been a research fellow at the Brookings Institution and postdoctoral fellow in political economy at the University of Chicago. He has published more than 150 articles in the area of labor and economic education and served as board member of many editorial, uh, <clears throat> board of many economic association. He has received numerous awards, teaching awards, and recognized by many organizations. He holds an AB in international relation from UW-Madison and a PhD in political economy from the John Hopkins University. Our last speaker will be Randy Cray. He is the director of Central Wisconsin Economic Research Bureau and professor of economics at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. He has been recognized uh, on numerous occasions by the Division of Business and Economics at UWSP for his research and community service. He has published many articles in the area of regional economics, where that's his specialty. Also, he has published over 100 quarterly economic indicator reports for Marathon and Portage and Wood Counties. Randy's a frequent speaker at the professional conferences and has been interviewed by many uh, people in the media. Randy holds an MA in accounting and MBA from Ball State University and has a PhD from Kansas State University. Please uh, welcome our first speaker, Mike Kanader. Well, th thank you, Hamid, and I would love to thank the organizers of the program. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I'm up here from Madison, as Hamid mentioned, and pleased to be a part of this panel, uh, and pleased to be in Marathon County. I grew up in Oneida County, so I'm familiar with this territory. It's nice to be back here. Um, my father actually spent his whole career running a paper machine at the paper mill in Rhinelander, which is now a Wausau paper. Uh, company, so uh, and I, I do a little bit of work for them now, so it's great to be here and um, pleased to see all of you here this evening. I'm going to give some remarks that will focus. Um, I think my assignment was to talk a lot about changes in the global economy, and, but of course, since I agreed to do this, there have been a lot of things that have happened in the U.S. economy that make it impossible for me to come and talk about the economy without focusing more really on what's happening in the U.S. right now, but I think globalization is really an integral part of what's led to uh, a certain path of development, uh, as was mentioned, and I think uh, it's impossible to understand where we are at this point in the economy without reference to that. So uh, that's how I will structure my remarks. So my overview is I'm going to give you a little bit of an, uh, an outlook for the U.S. and talk about the long-term fundamentals, which I think uh, have been quite positive for the last 20 years on average, they affect people in the economy differentially, so it hasn't been great for everyone. And I think education has been, you know, the big separator uh, over the last 20 years. People who have uh, college degrees have benefited from a lot of the structural changes in the economy. People who have not received college degrees are more vulnerable in this economy. The near-term challenges that we face, we've clearly been sort of thrown out of equilibrium, and I expect we'll, we'll go even further out of equilibrium toward higher rates of unemployment in the near term, and it'll require some uh, reshaping of government fiscal policies and probably monetary policy and regulation to get us back there. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what, what's next for us. I think the big questions people have, maybe three weeks ago, people were wondering, is this going to be the next Great Depression? You know, not just a recession, but really a complete meltdown. I feel pretty comfortable saying I, I don't envision that happening. I think the next question is, will we be like Japan uh, and the collapse they suffered in 1990 
where today the stock market in Japan is still at about 40% of the value it had reached in 1990. So that's, you know, 18 years later. So I think that's the scenario that people now worry about. And I would uh, say to you that I believe that our situation will be quite different and much more positive than that, because I do believe that the underlying fundamentals in our economy remain very strong. And uh, I know that may be hard to see or appreciate right now, but I'll talk a little bit about why I have that view. And I'll say a few things about the implications for investments. I gave a talk last week to UBS Private Wealth Management uh, Group, uh, a couple sessions of that, and they were interested in investment uh, thoughts. And I guess a lot of people probably are these days, so I thought I would leave that in my talk. Um, okay, so supply side fundamentals. Uh, most of the time, you know, when you hear commentators talk about the economy on TV, they obsess about a lot of near-term data releases and what's the you know, new unemployment claims going to be this week and what's the CPI. And there's a lot of, uh, well, you know, there's a lot of airtime that needs to be taken up. So people spend a lot of time talking about the details of the demand side of the economy and consumer expenditures and auto sales. And actually right now that data is pretty interesting and important, but most of the time that's just noise around the real story, which is, uh, to me, on the supply side of the economy. Is the labor force growing? Is the labor force skilled? Are workers finding matches with jobs at a reasonable rate? Are we providing enough capital for investment to increase our output per worker? And then is there enough innovation and ingenuity that even for a given amount of work and capital stock, we're producing even more output because productivity is growing? Those are the real drivers of progress in the economy. The reason living standards are higher today than they were 40 years ago is because productivity growth is greater. And so with a given amount of effort, we're able to produce more goods and services. And that's not an exciting thing to talk about. It doesn't change very much from one day to the next or one week to the next or even one year to the next. But if productivity grows at 2% a year instead of 1% a year, over 20 years, it's a huge deal. And that's been the good news in the US economy. So supply side fundamentals, uh, the first thing you learn in an economics course, or at least the first thing I learned in an economics course, I think, was something that they called Say's Law, which is essentially supply creates its own demand. The act of working and producing something and selling it for a certain amount of revenue creates spending power for the creator of the product and that money gets recycled into the economy. So the act of production creates its own demand. And as long as nothing disturbs that situation, things should run just fine. And in a sense, you know, uh, centuries after Say articulated his principle, it took Milton Friedman to shape people back up after I think we'd maybe lost our way a little bit and got too carried away with demand side management and Keynesian policies and Friedman kind of reminded us that in general monetary policy isn't the real story of what makes an economy work well. It can screw it up, but for the most part money isn't the real story. As much as we want to talk about interest rates and inflation rates, uh, as long as money supply is managed reasonably well, the real action's on the supply side of the economy. So how are we doing on the supply side? Well. I would say after a fairly difficult period in the 1970s and 80s, the U.S. economy has had very strong supply fundamentals for about 15 or 20 years, manifested in very solid growth in real GDP. Underneath that growth, and, and GDP is just the total value of goods and services produced in the economy in a given year. Underneath that, you know, how is it we produce more goods and services from one year to the next? Either we work more, so there's more workers, or we work longer hours. That's no great achievement, okay? But it can, it can cause GDP to go up. And, and for some countries, that's a major source of why their economies grow so rapidly. The labor force is growing rapidly. GDP can go up because we have a bigger capital stock, so we've got more machines and, and whatnot. So for a given amount of work, workforce, we can produce more output if we have more machines. That's nice, uh, but it takes a sacrifice of consumption to produce these machines, so it's not a costless way to boost output. 
the final way GDP grows is productivity growth, and that's kind of the, the magic elixir of the economy for a given capital stock and a given labor force. If we think of a better way to do something, we can actually produce more with the same amount of effort or input. And that, in the end, is, is the source of, I think, the biggest benefit to the economy. So not all GDP growth is created equal from the standpoint of how we will experience uh, living standards in the economy and, and real uh, welfare gains. And I think the nice thing about the last 15 or 20 years is that it's the GDP growth that's been higher than it was the previous two decades was higher because productivity growth was higher. We've had relatively low unemployment rates uh, compared to the 70s and 80s, a robust stock market until the last two months, and a rapid rise in the stock of wealth, again, until the last two months. And the question is, you know, will that bounce back? So I just want to show you a couple pictures. This is the GDP growth figure, and you can see here's the, the 70s and 80s period where we had a lot of bumps and wiggles and not as much progress. Uh, the 60s, we had reasonable growth. And then you can see after we came out of the last recession of the 80s, the economies performed pretty well from a real GDP growth standpoint. Unemployment rates, again, we're, uh, we're feeling bad about unemployment these days uh, at over 6%, but let's remember, you know, we had a recession in the early 80s that took us up close to 11%, and uh, we had recessions in the 70s with quite high unemployment rates as well. So uh, what we've seen since that big downturn in the early 80s is a pretty stable market for employment. The stock market index, the S&P 500 average, uh, charted here from 1970 to 2008, shows what I've been talking about. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, the index went up, but you can see after the recession of the early 90s, things really started to take off. And this is the dot-com uh, bubble and bust, and then a rebuilding of, of equity value and another bust. But still, even if you look at it today at an S&P average of around 1,000, you know, back in the mid-80s, we were at 200 or even the late 80s, so that's still a five-fold increase, which, you know, compared to what we've seen in Japan over that period of time is incredible performance. So um, sometimes you have to look back to, to keep perspective on where we are today. We certainly aren't where we were uh, a year ago, but we're still not in bad shape relative to where we were 20 years ago. So from a long-term fundamental standpoint, again, I would say potential growth in our economy increased in the 90s and, and the early part of this century as U.S. firms led the development of what we all talk about as the new economy. What is the new economy? It's, I would say, the, the, the companies and applications that have grown out of the fusion of information technology, telecommunications, and connectivity. It wasn't until I think the internet became widely accessible that you really realized the benefits or a lot of the benefits of the computer revolution and, and information technology advances and also telecommunications. All those things, first of all, have created industries unto themselves in which there's been tremendous wealth creation. So almost all of the new economy industries and companies are based in the United States. Now, they aren't based in Wisconsin. You know, there, there, there are pieces in Wisconsin. They're based largely in other parts of the country. But from a national standpoint, the U.S. has been a huge winner in, in this technological revolution. And in fact, if you talk to CEOs of new economy companies and ask them, who are the major foreign threats to your market position, you just get a blank stare. Because for the most part, Germany and Japan, France, the UK, are almost MIA in those sectors, which is very interesting. And it's important to remember how much we doubted our economic system in the 1980s when we were under pressure in the traditional areas in which we'd held advantage, auto, steel, heavy manufacturing, even production of aircraft. And I think we felt pressure from Germany, Japan, uh, increasingly Korea, that in a sense kind of threw us into retreat in some of those sectors, which I don't want to say they aren't important sectors and they're home to a lot of good jobs in Wisconsin in particular is a manufacturing oriented state. So it's very difficult for us. But 
our economy adjusted and found other uses for capital and labor, particularly high-skilled, highly educated labor, that has created tremendous wealth. It hasn't been evenly distributed, which we can talk about. But that's underlying a lot of this growth and productivity, not only the fact that we have created the companies that power the new economy, but we also have been able to apply the technology of the new economy in traditional companies to raise productivity. And so you, you see that marching on. And there have been other big waves of productivity growth in this country associated with the mechanization of agriculture. You know, and while we will look at this, and particularly in our part of the world, feel like, hey, this doesn't feel like progress to us, because we're losing good jobs in manufacturing, the same would have been said of the mechanization of agriculture 150 years ago. It didn't feel like progress to everyone who was relying on working on a farm for a living. Because with mechanization, those jobs became scarce, and people wound up having to find something else to do. But that's what freed up the labor for the Industrial Revolution. You never know where the jobs are going to appear in the future. You only can observe where they're being, in a sense, destroyed by the advance of technology. And so this is what we're experiencing in this country today. It's not pretty everywhere, to be sure, but it is the same kind of story of development that you've seen in other periods. The other big driver of the economy is what I would call global value creation, and that is, you know, this is the outsourcing of jobs that we talked about in the introduction, and that is another big phenomenon. Um, I think in the short term, it causes pain for the U.S. economy. In the long term, if U.S. companies uh, find effective partners and find ways to produce valuable products that meet consumers' needs by partnering with other countries, we can make the pie bigger. But in the short term, in particular, again, this will feed into manufacturing potentially and even other service sectors where you find um, work, even engineering work, being outsourced to groups in India or call center work. It can displace jobs locally. Eventually, people will find a, a place to adjust to, but in the intervening period, it can be very painful. But again, it is a form of the march of technology. And uh, we could try to shut the door on outsourcing. There are certain instances of outsourcing that I think might be somewhat egregious, but they're not all egregious. Some of it is in areas where you know, we don't really have the workforce here to do some of that work, and it enables our firms to still be world leaders. So I think these are the two trends that have driven productivity growth and the success of the U.S. economy in the last 20 years. U.S. firms remain well positioned to lead in these sectors, and the reason I say that, you know, first of all, you don't really see competition materializing in many of these sectors for U.S. companies. The reason it's working well here, the reason we dominate those industries is the rewards to innovation are high in this country. Capital markets are broad and deep, uh, and by that I mean firms at all stages of their development find it easier to get financing in this country than in most other countries. We have many different mechanisms to finance growth of a firm, traditional banks, you know, commercial banks, angel investors, there's mezzanine financing, private equity investment, there's a, a well-functioning stock market, well-functioning debt markets. Those things don't exist in every country in the world. And it's only here, I contend, that you find so many instances of companies like Microsoft, Oracle, Google, eBay, that go from something we've never heard of 10 years ago to among the largest market cap companies in the country today. That doesn't happen everywhere on the planet. You know, if you look at the 30 biggest market cap companies in America today, you will find many names that 25 years ago didn't exist or nobody would have heard of because they were tiny. If you look at the largest companies in Japan and Germany, they are the same names that were there 30 years ago. And I expect you'll, that will be true 20 years from now. And it's partly because they don't have the way to finance growth the way we do. Labor markets are more flexible here, so firms can take advantage of productivity growth opportunities more easily. Regulations are not excessive. Uh, in some places, they should have been stronger. Uh, skilled workers and immigrants are, are a big part of the mix here, so we provide a lot of skill to the workforce. There's a lot of higher education, which positions us well for the new economy, and we also accept 
foreign workers in who can fill some gaps that we have to keep our firms competitive. So I'll just bump ahead. This is a chart of labor productivity. You can see in the early period, 1970 through, say, 1995, there's a lot of periods where labor productivity is below 2% per year. Once you get to 1995, you see for almost a decade, it rarely fell below 2% growth in labor productivity in any particular year. Now, this is not pure productivity growth. I don't want Lee to get upset with me for putting this chart up here. He's a labor economist. So it, it involves a little bit of growth in capital stock and growth in pure productivity, but investment as a share of GDP hasn't been all that high during this period. So that kind of labor productivity performance for a 10-year period is quite extraordinary and, and has been a very positive development and I think reflects the fact that we have embraced technology change and globalization and have made a lot of structural changes that can pay some benefits. Now, the problem is, of course, now there's a lot of second guessing about what's happened in our economy. And so it's very interesting to sort of step back and take stock and say, you know, was all this just a mirage created by lax credit creation? And that's what many people have been contending for a number of years. And I think, you know, what I'm hoping to do is to try to talk about this 20-year period that has had some favorable trends and ask, was it really just a mirage or was some of it a mirage? What really happened here? And the, the people who think this was a bit of a mirage would say there were a lot of symptoms of lax credit creation that have been going on for a long time that may have been driving economic performance that wasn't sustainable. And the evidence of that would be negative personal savings rates, a surge in consumption as a share of GDP. So just, you know, consumers are spending more and more, and there isn't as much left for investment in the economy. Federal budget has been in deficit for much of the period that we're talking about, and we've had increasingly large current account deficits, meaning we're borrowing capital from abroad to finance investment here and consumption here, and we can't keep doing that forever. So I think we want to ask, you know, was there some irrational behavior going on here that was driving the economy beyond its natural speed limit, and that's why we came crashing down, and maybe we can never get back to this growth that we've had the last 15 or 20 years because it was all a mirage. So here's some of the evidence that people point to when they want to critique our economic performance, and what you see is savings rates in the economy. Um, for much of the period graphed here, 1960 up until about the mid-80s, really around 8% savings rate per year. Then it starts a steady decline beginning in the early 90s that drives it all the way down to a point where it's actually below zero. We had a negative savings rate in one quarter in early 2006. So that looks pretty alarming. I have five minutes left. Okay. And um, consumption as a share of GDP, which is kind of the flip side of that, you can see was 62% of GDP for the first part of that chart. Then it kind of steadily rises to 67%, kicks around there for a while, and then it shoots up to 70% the last few years. So we are consuming more as a share of GDP. Maybe we're not investing enough. And then here's the current account, which looks like we've been um, financing this big consumption binge by borrowing capital from abroad. And if we stop doing that, Maybe, you know, we're all out of gas. So what is the real story? Uh, is it really an unsustainable economy? Well, for about 20 years, far longer than just the recent housing bubble, the savings rate has been falling, consumption shares rising, and the current account deteriorating. And the question is, was the impetus for all these changes some change in consumer behavior and banking behavior that created too much credit and led to really irresponsible behavior by, by who? All of us, right? That, that's what we're talking about. I mean, have all households become really irresponsible or households on average? And, you know, most people I talk to tend to think, and I, I would say this is based on media accounts, that that is the answer, that, that we have been collectively irresponsible. But if I ask any particular person that has that view, if they think they've been irresponsible, they're pretty sure they haven't, okay? It's a little bit like a survey we did when I was at the Council of Economic Advisors when we were thinking about health care reform, and we, they, they did a poll of people, and we asked people, 
you know, is your own healthcare situation satisfactory, you know, new, very good, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory? And 90% of people responding picked the top two. It was either satisfactory or very satisfactory. And then we ask the same people, the next question is, the healthcare system overall, is it satisfactory, you know, very satisfactory, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory? 90% of the people said it was unsatisfactory. It's very interesting. I mean, how did they arrive at that view? It couldn't have been from talking to the other people because they were mostly satisfied. So you have to be careful in, in how you assess these things. So are we a nation of irrational spendthrifts? Or, or, are it, or is this all this data, because everything I just showed you is true, the savings rates did decline, the current account deficit went up, but productivity was also a lot higher. GDP growth was better, unemployment rates were lower, so, and, and inflation wasn't going up over this period, which leads people to think maybe the economy wasn't going past its speed limit. And I think the answer, not surprisingly, I'm an economist, I'm gonna say somewhere in between those two things. It is a bit of both, and I think in particular, uh, for the early part of this period, I think what, what we really saw was strong fundamentals and a rational response to an economy that was performing better than most people expected. And remember, their expectations were formed in the 1970s and 1980s when, frankly, people were really pessimistic. And they felt like we're being run out of the industries that we own, the stock market wasn't doing very well, wealth really wasn't accumulating at a very good rate in either financial investments or real estate. Then you get to 1990 through 2005, and things really turned around. And there was a lot more wealth creation. Stock market did extremely well. And I think people found themselves in a position where they had met or exceeded the targets they had in providing for retirement. Now, in the last two months, I'm not talking about that right now, that's changed, but for a good period of time, I think people were rationally responding to better than expected performance. So unexpectedly high returns on investments and even labor effort. So with productivity going up, average income in the economy was going up. Again, not felt as much in Marathon County or Oneida County where we're more manufacturing based, but nationwide on average, it was being felt. Higher productivity was causing higher real incomes. And the current account, um, I would say, was behaving as you would expect, given that the US entered this period of globalization with what I call a strong balance sheet. We had very attractive real estate, very attractive firms for people to invest in, and a lot of the capital inflows from foreign countries that facilitated the consumption and investment by us were just a rational response to everyone in the globe deciding now that I can invest anywhere, buy real estate anywhere, where am I gonna buy real estate? Well, I'll tell you what, there are a lot of foreign people that wanna buy property in the United States. And there aren't a lot of US citizens that wanna buy a vacation home in Germany, Japan, Great Britain. If you've ever been there, you know why. It just doesn't have the same attractive coastline and infrastructure and you know, quality of life, uh, population density, all that. So we had a very strong balance sheet, and I think what you saw was exactly a response to that. So what I would say is, for a good period of time, what was going on is confident households borrow against better expected future income, and also were realizing the benefits of selling off assets at pretty high prices. Again, not everyone, but there was a lot of property sales at the margin, et cetera. And I would say the parallel uh, to what happened over that 15-year period, no one expected this formation of the new economy and the wealth, wealth creation that accompanied it. Just like Norway didn't realize they had oil in the North Sea in the 1970s. But the minute they discovered it and appreciated how much wealth was there, well in advance of extracting it from the, the, the bottom of the sea, they began to spend more, there were big foreign capital inflows, the savings rate went down, and it was all a rational response to real fundamentals. And I think that's very much the story of what happened to the macro aggregates in the US. I would say since you know, at least three to five years ago, it's been a different story, and, and this artificial demand has probably pumped up the economy, and we know that we have a lot of problems associated with 
too much credit creation and uh, the financial crisis that we're in now. And I know I'm out of time, but I just want to say, you know, what are, what are the current risks that we face? Um, we're trying to avoid the Japanese scenario, and I think that means the Federal Reserve has had to restore confidence and liquidity in the banking system. So I'm someone who believes we did have to do something as much as we don't want to see wealthy people benefit from it. Um, you know, that was the same thing that drove policy in the Great Depression, and I don't think we want to repeat that. I think the next thing we'll see is a very aggressive fiscal stimulus from a new administration, and I think that's necessary to jumpstart demand, but we probably have to pair that with some credible long-term plans to reduce the deficit that, that everybody believes in or we won't spend the, the tax cuts that we get. I worry a little bit that our infrastructure is poorly positioned for a high energy price world. I wish we'd have higher taxes on energy consumption because I think if we did that, our country is capable of a lot of innovation in that area and that could be the next industry of the future where we see a lot of wealth creation and that may actually benefit states like Wisconsin. I think we might be well positioned for that. And I think in general our leadership has fallen a bit out of favor. I'm a big fan of Fareed Zakari. He's a talk show host and the editor of Newsweek International. And I think uh, his recent book uh, says that pretty well. I'll just show you a little bit about, um, just so you can see what our history has been like, even with this market correction. Uh, this is the US stock market index, which is the one that's on the top. If you start out in 1990, against the European Citigroup Index, you know, even with what's happened lately, we've gone from a normalized value of 100 up to 350. In Europe, it's still below 250. If you look at Japan, as I said earlier, they're at about half of what their stock market was in 1990. We're up about 3.5 times. And then if you look at the US versus emerging markets, they outperform us. This chart starts in 1992 because the Emerging Market Index was only produced then. But you can see they're a lot more volatile. They have some real big ups and downs and a lot of churning. They've somewhat outperformed us, but with much higher risk. So I still think uh, we have a good future, but we've got to use uh, fiscal and monetary policy to get the economy moving again. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lee Hansen. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Also delighted to hear my colleague, Mike Netter, bring us up to date on the current state of the economy. Very illuminating, and it's something we've all been trying to figure out, and I think he's given us a lot of help tonight in doing that. I want to talk about labor adjustments to uh, change, globaliz globalization, and other changes. Let me hand you that, because they don't need it. Uh, th this, I think, is the decade of the economist. The uh, issues are so widespread and so numerous that we're all hard put to try to figure out what's going on. We've got the global uh, financial crisis. We've got the crisis here in the States. Uh, we've got an impending recession. Uh, there's globalization as well. And uh, we have to think now about what the economic policies will be of our new president. And obviously, there are formidable challenges there. And it's going to be very interesting to see how Obama uh, does it. But uh, I really want to limit my topic to uh, globalization. And um, uh, it's such a large topic that I've tried to narrow it down to look simply at the impact on the workforce, the impact on employment and training programs, and the uh, need for more education and training, which has been asserted by a large number of reports. And I'll mention another recent one that just came out recently. Now, we've all heard a lot about plant closings, uh, plant relocations, plant uh, movement here and there, and the layoffs that result from them. They don't all 
occur as a result of globalization. We've had technical change going on for decades, centuries, with a lot of displacement. And uh, globalization often takes the rap for being the guilty party, but we've had a lot of changes going on, and I think the effects are overrated. Globalization brings with it both benefits and costs. And the benefits, I think, are pretty well known. And uh, I think all of you will find that out tonight when you go home and get ready for bed, take off your clothes, take a look at the labels in your clothing. And I expect you'll find names like India, Turkey, China, Guatemala, and who knows what else. And very few of you will have any Made in America labels. Now, why do you have this clothing from these exotic countries? Uh, maybe you once visited them and were attracted by um, something about their culture. Um, maybe uh, you have relatives or friends there. But I think the reason why you have them is because they're cheap. They're inexpensive. I don't mean cheap in terms of quality. They're inexpensive, and you buy them. And what this means is that people have shifted their purchases from American-made goods to foreign-made goods. And... Uh, they feel that they're better off. And this is one of the real benefits of global trade. We find that we can get things more cheaply, better made elsewhere, and we buy them. And likewise, other countries are buying things from us. Now the question is, how do you get, how can you estimate what the benefits are from these foreign import goods? The Federal Reserve Board did a study recently in which they tried to estimate the impact of foreign imports on the consumer price index. The consumer price index, as you know, is the measure of inflation that everybody talks about. Once a month, we get a new report on what the CPI is doing. Uh, based on a number of studies that they combined and looked at together, they estimate that the consumer price index increased probably by a half to 1% less than would have been the case had we not had these foreign imports coming in. In other words, our CPI rose by, let's say, 28% over the decade 1995 to 2005, roughly 2.5% per year. Without the, these foreign goods that we bought, it would have been 3 to 3.5%. Three now the question, you say, well, what does that mean? Think of it in these terms. Real money income, family income adjusted for inflation for the period 1995 to 2005 was basically flat. No increase in incomes once you adjust for changes in the price level. Had we not had these foreign imports, the CPI would have increased more. And in fact, average family income would have declined by 5 to 10% over the last decade. Now, if that had been the case, I think we'd all be much more glum about life than we are. But that gives you some idea of what the benefits of globalization have been in terms of trade and imports for us. The other side of the coin, the costs of globalization are <clears throat> difficult to estimate as well. They're most apparent, of course, in mass layoffs, plant closings, plant relocations, and so on. And typically, these costs fall on a fairly small segment of the labor force. Not everybody is displaced by globalization, just a few are. They're in Wisconsin, they're all over the states, but the numbers are relatively small. And what do we see as evidence of this? Well, unemployment rates go up. Labor force growth may change a bit. Uh, people have difficulty finding new jobs. And we often try to create programs that will help them deal with these adversities. We, uh, we have been attracted, of course, by the fact that we can buy these inexpensive foreign goods, often of high quality. Think of the Japanese in the 80s and 90s with all of their electronics equipment that we were not producing here. And so we were all better off as a result. Meanwhile, the costs were 
fell, fall on a relatively small percent of the population. And so the question is, do the benefits offset the costs? Have the benefits of globalization and trade been greater than the cost in displacement and unemployment? Now, let's assume that they're equal. The benefits roughly equal the cost, but the distribution of the benefits is pervasive, spread widely over the population. The costs fall on a relatively small segment of the population. In principle, and welfare economics talks about this, the gainers, the, the winners, could compensate the, lunar, the losers. Uh, all the people who gain because they're wearing less expensive clothing made elsewhere, in effect could be somehow taxed or make contributions to the people who are unemployed and who have suffered from the consequences of that trade. But the difficulty is how do you do that? How do you go out and collect? You know, I could take up a collection here for the unemployed and probably because all of you are wearing foreign made clothes that you bought very cheaply, my guess is I would not find very much in the collection plate. You'd say, well, why should I do this for them? So what we've done is to take collective action. We take action through government to try to compensate the losers. And we've done this in a number of ways. Uh, back in the early 1960s, there was a lot of concern, President Kennedy concerned about the unemployment in West Virginia with the decline of the coal industry. And there was a lot of concern then about automation, that by 1980 we would all be working no more than 20 hours a week because technology would have made all of our work obsolete. We wouldn't be needed. Uh, and so in 1962, we passed something called the Manpower Development and Training Act. And that was to help retrain people whose jobs were destroyed, uh, to relocate them if necessary, and provide the kind of help that everybody recognized was needed. It's not clear how effective that program was, but we went ahead in 1972 and created something called the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. And this was, again, to deal with some of the problems of the recession in the early 1970s. But it was also designed to deal with uh, people who are chronically unemployed, the poor, et cetera, to try to help them get into the labor force so they could earn their own way. Uh, I was involved with the Manpower Institute of the UW system uh, from about 1976 to 1981 or 82. And so I got to see a lot of these CEDAR programs around the state. Uh, unfortunately, in my view, they really did not work very well. And uh, we were spending 16, 18 billion dollars a year on those programs, to my mind, not to any great effect. In 1974, we passed something called the Trade, Assistance, Trade Adjustment Assistance Act. And that was to try to help people who were displaced by foreign competition, uh, to tide them over in some way, retrain them so they could move back into the labor force once again. Uh, I really haven't followed that program very closely. It's still going on, and I see recently on the Department of Labor webpage that there are some uh, uh, benefits going to people in Wisconsin, but Brandy may know more about that than I do. So we've tried a number of things to a uh, number of public policies to deal with these issues, but I'm not sure they've been nearly as successful as people hoped they would be. And I think basically what it comes down to is that we all benefit from this kind of trade, but very few of the people who suffer the costs receive any fair measure of compensation. Now let me step back a little bit uh, and uh, mention something about technical change, which is what it's called. There was a great American economist called Joseph Schumpeter, S-C-H-U-M-P-E-T-E-R, an, Austri an Austrian who came to this country in the 1930s maybe to escape uh, the oppression going on over there. And uh, he had written a book much earlier and he characterized capitalism as involving the, the process of creative destruction, creative destruction. And I think a lot of people were baffled by that because they couldn't quite understand it, given the success that they observed of capitalism. Well, he talked about new combinations 
of doing things. And he mentioned five of them in particular that make common sense to all of you. One, introducing a new product. And we've seen scads of new products in the last few years. Introducing a new method of production. Opening a new market. Getting access to resources from another country. Creating a new kind of organization within a firm or within an industry. All of these are examples of what is often called loosely technological change. But knowing these five components here it makes it much easier to think about specific cases. So if capitalism is the process of creative destruction, how effectively have we dealt with it? Well, let me give you some examples. Uh, back in the 1940s and 1950s, the Agricultural productivity rose enormously in this country. Hybrid corn, tractors, better fertilizers, productivity increased tremendously, and the farm population decreased dramatically. Where did they all go? We don't hear much about displaced farmers. Somehow, they've adjusted, and they continue to adjust because the small family farms, more and more of them are disappearing every year. The displacement of rural southern blacks in the 1930s and again in the 1950s. Uh, mechanical devices to harvest cotton and, and uh, so on displaced enormous amounts of labor. And of course, they migrated north where they had friends or relatives. And uh, we've had, here we see the problem of adjustment. But, uh, and it's not clear that we've been able to really deal with that very effectively. The shift of textiles and shoe factories out of New England in the, the 50s, going down to the South, South Carolina, et cetera, and then eventually, of course, all of our shoes are made in Brazil or Italy, and our textiles are made in India, Turkey, et cetera. The decline of the coal industry in West Virginia in the 1950s. The demise of telephone operators. You know, there were thousands, literally millions of telephone operators back in the 40s, 50s, because you had to pick up the uh, receiver and you would get number please and you would say Jackson 7486. That was our number at the time. But eventually they were all gone because we have automatic dialing. Uh, what about the displacement of hot lead printers? My dad was a printer all of his life, linotype, monotype. And, um, by the time he retired in the early 50s, he was the last of that occupation, replaced by high-speed presses, lithograph, et cetera. The displacement of the railroad workers. The decline of the railroads in the 1950s, 60s was dramatic. Trucks, airplanes took their place. Where did all those workers go? Did we have programs to deal with displaced railroad workers? No. What about the gasoline station attendants? You know, years ago you drove up, fellow ran out, filled your tank, you paid him, away you went. Now you drive up, you jump out, open the gas tank, you do your own gasoline tank filling and put your credit card in and pay. And so how did all of those people find other jobs? What about bank tellers with all these ATM machines wherever you go? Uh, bank tellers, you'd run into banks all the time. Now you go into banks, hardly anybody is there except people wanting to take out loans. And even grocery store clerks are diminishing in number as we have these automatic checkout machines. Well, the point is that there have been all kinds of changes going on continuously, mainly as a result of technical change, not globalization, that has pushed many occupations into extinction caused many industries to decline and wither away, and yet these people have somehow found, found new kinds of occupations. Uh, maybe sometimes they don't pay as well, but we do not have the massive unemployment that one might expect we would have given all of these changes that have occurred. Now, what can we do about all of this? My guess is that we now have both globalization and uh, technical change. And Mike mentioned the impact of technical change, enormous. And we're going to have more of the effects of globalization. What can we do? Well, one 
uh, suggestion many people make is tariffs, quotas. Let's limit these imports so they will not undercut the American worker. Uh, economists take a very dim view of this sort of thing. And one reason is that often you set up tariffs, you set up quotas, and you can never get rid of them. We're still providing subsidies to the sugar industry that we set up back in World War II. Cotton is still subsidized. Once you get these in place, you can't get rid of them. And so the best thing to do is avoid them whenever possible. And one way to do this is through <clears throat> multinational agreements. NAFTA would be one good example of that. A second alternative is, OK, five minutes. We've got lots of time. A second alternative is to uh, do the traditional things, extend unemployment beyond 26 weeks for people who are displaced. Uh, improve the job service so they can go to one place and find out where there are, are other jobs that they can take up. And finally, providing more training and uh, uh, training programs uh, that will help people whose occupational skills are now obsolete and uh, so they can find new skills and move off and succeed as they were before. The third uh, alternative is one that uh, Mike alluded to, and that is the need for improved education and training in American schools and, I would add, colleges. By all of the international rankings, we do really quite poorly in terms of mathematical achievement, reading achievement, knowledge of science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, we face competition from the rest of the world, and they are moving into education in a big way. China has hundreds, perhaps thousands of universities. I read a recent article about colleges, universities in China that started with zero students in the year 2000, now have 35,000 students. Uh, many of them are coming here for advanced training, which they will take back. And so we're going to face really tough competition from these other countries unless we can upgrade the skills of our labor force. <coughs> and it begins with the schools. Now, uh, as a teacher, of course, I have assignments for you. Uh, one is a book called Tough Choices or Tough Times. Uh, this just came out a few months ago. And it talks about the need to improve the quality of schooling, again, from actually from preschool to through college. Uh, this is a long report written by a lot of good people, including Ray Marshall, who was the Secretary of Labor back in the Carter administration. Uh, and the head of the committee actually was a fellow named Chuck Knapp, former president of the University of Georgia, and one of my own PhD students back in the early 1970s. Anyway, it's a very forceful report and might be something you would want to have discussed by people at your policy center and maybe uh, make some chapters available to people so you could have a community-wide discussion of it. The other uh, reading assignment is a new 19, or 2007 book by Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winner, a fantastic economist, wonderful person. It's called Making Globalization Work. Uh, he's been, uh, let's see, he's now at Columbia. There goes the clicker. He's now at Columbia University. He uh, was uh, head of the uh, sec or chief economist for the International Monetary Fund. He's been with the World Bank. He's traveling around. He is probably the most knowledgeable person on earth about globalization and its impact. Again, this might be a suitable topic for some reading and discussion groups that you would organize in your, your uh, new institute. Now, the question is, if we are concerned about the quality of our workforce, what can we do about it? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult to do very much until some real crisis erupts. The mobilizing the political and financial support to improve the skills of the Wisconsin labor force, the national labor force, is going to be daunting. But the alternative is worse. 
and that is sliding backward because others are moving ahead of us more quickly. Uh, there's an interesting story recounted in the, uh, the Tough Choices book about England, written by a person named Corelli Barnett. And actually, I had read this book about 10 years ago. And it mentioned that England was once technologically in advance of every other country in the world. But they did not continually invest in the education and training of their workforce. And they've gradually slid behind our probably now second or third rate nation as far as technology and economy goes. So the question is, do we want to uh, bite the bullet and do what we have to do, hard as it may be? Or are we going to let ourselves slide sideways and see countries like India and China soon catch up to us and perhaps even move ahead of us? Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Randy Cray. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Sounds good. Um, I need the. I want me the clicker. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for having me here and having the opportunity to speak. My name is Randy Cray. I'm the director of the Economic Research Bureau at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. Uh, I want to thank our, uh, our sponsor of the CWERB, that is the MNI Bank in Stevens Point and also the MNI Bank in uh, Marshfield for uh, providing resources to help me do th uh, things like this. Well, I want to say uh, first off, um, the things that we've talked about earlier, uh, I think certainly are germane to what I'm going to be talking about, the long-term uh, structural uh, benefits of all of these factors uh, will help the, the economy improve. Right now, things aren't so great, and I'm going to go over uh, a number of things to suggest that, that perhaps we are not in the, in the best of shape, at least on a, a, uh, on a temporary basis. So long run, uh, the fundamentals are, are quite strong, but in the short run, I, I think we do have uh, some problems. Also, too, I'm going to try to incorporate as much as I can the impact of globalization that changes uh, how it impacts the central Wisconsin economy. And I'm going to define central Wisconsin as being Marathon, Portage, and Wood Counties. Traditionally, I have done that, uh, and um, I will continue to do that in tonight's uh, report. So I'll uh, give you a basic feel for how I'm going to approach this. I'm going to talk about things going on at the national level and at the state level, and then I'm going to work our way back to central Wisconsin. So I, I feel like I have to set you know, the context uh, for that. So I'm going to do a little bit of, a, of a background on this, and then we'll get into some of the specifics. And I hope that that uh, will put some of the, uh, the things that we'll be looking at into, uh, into context. Um, there is no doubt that the national economy is feeling the effects of the collapse of the subprime housing market and the pain being felt in the nation's uh, financial sector. The problems have now spread to the real economy, the so-called real economy. The National Bureau of Economic Research has not officially declared the U.S. to be in a recession. However, most economists would say that we're probably already in one. Uh, please consider the following evidence. In fourth quarter of 2007, uh, we experienced a decline in GDP. And in first quarter of 2008, well, that was a very weak one in terms of growth. And perhaps future revisions will uh, push that into the negative, uh, uh, in the negative category. Moreover, second quarter of this year uh, was propped up somewhat by government tax rebates, so we did get some, a positive bump up in growth, but uh, to some degree that was uh, due to the tax rebates. However, a lot of economists uh, debate uh, how much effect that really had on things. Others say that you know, it was maybe uh, you know, 60 cents on the dollar impact of the economy, something that I'm not going to quibble over that. Now, third quarter of 2008 was negative. Everybody in this room has probably uh, heard that and is aware of that that is the case. 
Given this and the fact that the fourth quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009 are likely to register sharp declines in economic activity, it's very likely, in my opinion, that the MBER will say that we entered a recession in late 2007. So we've been in a recession, in my opinion, for maybe uh, quite a while. Time will tell whether I'm right or wrong. The most recent data for GDP, that is the third quarter, indicates that the economy declined by an annualized rate of about three-tenths of one percent. Now this is only the fifth quarter in the last 68 quarters that we've actually registered a, de a decline. And as uh, Mike mentioned, GDP measures the monetary value of all final goods and services produced in the economy, typically one year is, is the standard. There are a number of other indicators su also suggesting that the economy is contracting and will continue to do so. Uh, for example, we can look at net job loss. In the U.S., it's around 800,000 jobs for the year 2008. Moreover, a recent survey of employers indicate that a large number of, the, of them are likely to reduce their payrolls next year, so we're likely to see this number rise by a, a substantial amount. In addition, industrial production, a measure of the nation's uh, factories, their output declined by a full 6% on an annualized basis in third quarter. In addition, personal consumption expenditures by households fell by 3.1% in the third quarter. Now this is very important because as you probably have already picked up in, in terms of earlier discussion, Household spending accounts for a very large part of GDP. It's the spending that you do, your friends do, so on and so forth. It accounts for, for anything from like two-thirds to 70% of GDP, depending upon uh, which period you're looking at. You'd have to go back to 1980 to find a larger quarterly decline in consumer spending. In previous reports, when I say previous reports and other reports I have written in terms of the ERB, I have alluded to falling housing prices, the drop in the stock market, job loss or the fear of job loss as being major contributors as to why uh, that consumer confidence has uh, fallen and why it's now at an all-time low and this has had an impact of course upon consumption. The conference board uh, reports that the index has contracted from about 110 in October of 2007 down to about 40 in October of this year. A very very steep drop, a, a record low as a matter of fact. Further, um, I'm not going to get into all of the gory details with regard to investment, investment uh, by uh, business firms in uh, factory plant and equipment and inventories, other than to say that it was not all that strong dur during the uh, period. Now one thing to help offset that was that real federal and state expenditures increased, well at the federal level, by almost 14 percent on an annualized basis during the third quarter and the states, well, only up by about 1.4 percent. And also, two exports, if you look at that, they were up substantially uh, in terms of a percentage, 12 percent, and imports fell somewhat by about 1.9. The bottom line of it is, without the, the federal government injection into the economy, the spending, and the improvements in the net exports position, those GDP results would have been considerably worse, worse than what we already uh, talked about. Now looking forward to the future, the leading indicators, uh, composite index, the leading indicators has been on a downward trend. Since about mid-2007, the index has fallen pretty consistently, thus indicate, uh, indicating an ongoing weakening of the economy. Also making matters harder for policymakers is the upward mover, movement in the consumer price index. The index from September of 07 to 08 increased by about 5%. However, the good news is that the rate has tended to moderate as the economy has, has slowed. In September of this year, the uh, rate decreased by, uh, to a much more modest rate of about two and a half percentage points. Now, the Wisconsin Department of Revenue forecast is that for Wisconsin, they expect to see a decline in total non-farm employment of about a half a percent this year and about four uh, tenths of a percent in 2009. Uh, they indicate that it will be well into 2010 before the trend is reversed. The U.S. is forecasted to outperform Wisconsin in job and income growth, according to the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. The state also reports that home prices in Wisconsin are declining, just for some additional information. 
from second quarter of 07 to second quarter of 08, home prices were down about 3%. Now that's not bad compared to what's going on in say places like California, Florida, Nevada, for example. Also bankruptcy filings for Wisconsin have been up sharply for the uh, month of, uh, not the month, excuse me, the quarter, third quarter of 2008, up by about 38% over one year earlier. Now the major factors driving the forecast, uh, I had an opportunity to serve as an advisor to the Wisconsin Department of Revenue's uh, uh, forecasting uh, uh, board for a number of years. Uh, a group of us uh, uh, went, uh, got together and uh, gave our opinions with regard to these forecasts. So I am somewhat familiar as to how these things are uh, put together and uh, Global Insights uh, approach to generating the model, uh, the, the major state model. And the things that tend to drive the Wisconsin economy, major drivers, not the only thing, not the only thing at all, but some of the major things is, of course, the manufacturing sector. Wisconsin uh, is uh, much more relied upon, uh, reliant upon manufacturing than, say, the nation as a whole. If memory serves me correctly, I think we're the second most dependent state uh, in the entire United States, depending upon manufacturing as a source uh, of employment. Also, another thing that drives our forecast is uh, our status as a, a net energy importer. Uh, we do not have much in the way of oil fields or coal mines or that sort of thing, so that's another major driver. However, you know, with lower, the lower valuation of the dollar and the recent decline in energy prices, these could help bolster state exports and stem the outflow of dollars spent on energy thus perhaps reducing some of the, uh, the negativity that um, the Wisconsin Department of Revenue uh, is indicating. Only time will tell. I, I don't pretend to, to know the answer to that. Until the housing market stabilizes in the nation and until there is evidence of a restoration of the flow of credit, an improvement in household finances and a recapitalization of the nation's financial sector, the U.S. and state economy is going to experience a rocky road. Once these issues are resolved, and they will be, I mean, the fundamentals, as Mike uh, discussed, are, have been and I think will continue to be uh, good for the United States. We're a very dynamic economy can, and have has a tremendous, uh, we have a tremendous capacity to, to adapt to situations. The nation and Wisconsin will return to positive growth, but we have some uh, short-term problems, the so-called you know, blips, the white noise around the long-term trends. Uh, of course, these, uh, these blips, the, this, this noise is something we all, we all have to live with and have to, to deal with. So you know, it's something we have to consider. Now let's take a look at our uh, thing here. Let's see if I can uh, you know, operate this thing halfway decently. Um, I just included this just for the sake of argument. We have all of our past reports archived at our website, uh, all the special reports. It's not just yours truly doing economic reports, but we commission reports by various individuals in, on our faculty or from state organizations to do uh, reports uh, pertaining to the economy. Okay, so I just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, our first table, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because I've already given you a lot of info on it. I, I'm talking about third quarter to third quarter. This is the way we always set our reports up. And in this year over comparison, you can see what some of the numbers are with regard to the consumer price index, treasury bill rates, industrial production, real GDP. Once again, we're measuring not from the beginning of the year, but from third quarter to third quarter. And depending on when your beginning and ending uh, point are, you're going to get different numbers. And that's going to vary from what I talked about. The next overhead that we have, though, gets into central Wisconsin, and that's really what I want to talk about. Having set the stage to what's going on at the macro level, what the state is saying is going on with our economy, let's take a look at central Wisconsin here. And let's see if I can hit the laser button. We'll focus in on uh, Marathon County. And Marathon County, uh, the unemployment rate rose slightly uh, by about one-tenth of one percent. Uh, from, from a year ago. You can also see Portage and Wood Counties, the other components. Now for central Wisconsin, we use a very simple labor force weighted unemployment rate and there was, there's been no change taking place in the unemployment rate here in central Wisconsin from September to September. All right, Wisconsin, there was a decline uh, in the unemployment rate 
up to down to 4.4 percent and the U.S. at uh, 6 percent. Just to put things into perspective, let's take a look at our next overhead. Employment in central Wisconsin, once again, Marathon, Portage, and Wood Counties. Uh, I'm going to focus in on Marathon because that's where we're here tonight. You can see that there was a decline in the employment number down by about two percentage points. Now, admittedly, we're only looking at one year's worth of data, but having done this over a long period of time, I can tell you that the trend for Portage, for Marathon and Wood has been to increase, albeit at a slow pace, uh, typically about 1% increase in this. So we are seeing a little bit of a decline happening here in Marathon County, and I'll explain why as we move through some of the additional tables. Uh, Wood County, you can see the employment number. Central Wisconsin, we're down just slightly as the estimation by about three-tenths of a percentage point. Wisconsin actually increased over that time period where the nation went down. Let's go move forward. Central Wisconsin employment change by sector. Uh, basically, we're looking once again at non-farm data. This is information that is collected by the government based upon uh, data that they collect from employers. And what we see, whoops, I need to go backwards here. I'm getting, getting ahead of myself. Um, what we see here is that our non-farm employment is down by about 1.1%. Now, this, since about the year 2000, I'm going to jump to this line here. Manufacturing, not just in central Wisconsin, but in Wisconsin, has been a source of weakness. The changing of the economy, as, as alluded to by Mike and, to, and by Lee, that this is an ongoing, you know, uh, situation. You, you're looking at structural changes, changes in technology, plus the influence of, you know, globalization impacting the, these numbers. And we do have, have seen a rather substantial decline in employment in manufacturing. This has been especially to, true in the paper products industry. Uh, I do not have those numbers with me tonight, but in other uh, venues and other presentations I've done, I've had those. And it's rather startling, the decline in paper products uh, manu manufacturing. Now, where are these people going? I mean, what are the sectors that uh, are showing growth? Well, once again, this is only a year over kind of comparison, but I can tell you these trends have been going on for the, the, the 2000s. You can look at education and health services. Very typically, you're seeing increases going on there as, as an area that is absorbing uh, individuals and providing employment. Leisure and hospitality, information and business services. These typically have been growing and growing at fairly uh, substantial rates to uh, help offset some of the declines that we see happening in the uh, manufacturing sector. Um, and the rest of this, well, you can, you can look at. Time does not permit me to do a full-blown uh, discussion of this. Let's go on to table five. Uh, we take a look at county sales tax distributions as a measure of retail activity because retail activity is where the, most of the purchases happen. And we talked about consumption spending by households. This is a good barometer of the economy and what's been happening or taking place. Portage County up by about 4%. Marathon practically the same, a little bit lower, but a big drop in, in Wood County uh, numbers. Uh, Wood County has been experiencing uh, you know, some difficulties, especially in the southern part of, of the county, as most of you are probably aware of. Table six, we do a survey of regional business executives each and every quarter. And this panel that we survey, well, first off, I better explain our little uh, legend here. One is a, a substantially better, 100, 50 the same, zero substantially worse. And uh, these readings for recent changes in the national, recent changes in the local, uh, these are about as low as what we've seen at the ERB going on the backwards to you know, the mid-1980s when, when I started doing this sort of stuff. So uh, this group is certainly well aware of what's going on at the national level and also too their perception of what's happening locally uh, I think is surprisingly um, uh, pessimistic given the fact that some of our numbers suggest that the local economy has held up rather well um, considering what's going on. 
When we ask them about what's going to happen at the national level, the local level, and this is the one that I really like to take a look at, industry conditions, because they know more about their industries than what I do, and I, as an economist, I like to you know, get some feedback on that. They're basically telling us that things are not going to be changing all that much. Well, given the fact that they think that matters, economic matters, have deteriorated, they're basically saying that they don't see really any improvement taking place in a, in a, in a situation that they deem to have deteriorated. Uh, table 7, this is a, a basically a duplicate of one of the other ones. I'm going to just skip this. There's no reason to go into this in any uh, uh, great degree. Um, we have and this is sort of a composite because I wanted to get all of the data on here and uh, whatever. This is our survey of retailers, of merchants. We literally survey retailers in all of these communities to get their feel for what's going on at the, in the retail sector, not just relying upon the sales tax data. And since we're in Wausau, let's, uh, let's focus in on those numbers. And you can see that they're pretty much in the 50s which means about the same. Now, from a historic standpoint, in, in better economic times, robust times, let's say in the 90s, for example, it would be very common to see these numbers in the 70s from, from, this, from this group. Uh, these numbers are, are trending, uh, trending quite a bit lower than what we normally, normally would see. So I would just ask you to just focus in on that column. Don't get too hung up on the rest of this. There, there's, there's too much data to possibly to absorb. Uh, table, table number nine, help wanted advertising, and help wanted advertising, there was a, um, obviously with the advent of the internet and with other means of advertising like through trade journals and whatever, uh, advertising in newspapers is not nearly as important as what it once was, but still, economists look at this as a barometer of economic conditions and uh, the, what might happen to the unemployment rate in the future. Whoops, we better go back. Uh, what might happen in the future? And our index for Marshfield, Stevens Point, and Wausau, well, it's, it's been on a decline for quite a long time. Um, mirroring, it's a, it's a mirror image, I guess, of what's going on at the national level, okay? Let's take a look at number 10, public assistance claims. Mar Marshfield, Portage County, and Wausau. And you can read the numbers yourself here. I mean, it's a, a rather sharp increase of close to 20% occurring over the past, uh, past year. Um, so, some indication that the, that the economy is, uh, it has weakened. But let's go to 11. Uh, unemployment claims. Unemployment claims, these are the new ones. Uh, and basically what we're looking at here is some rather substantial increases in unemployment claims. If you take public assistance and the unemployment claims, it's, it gives, it's a proxy for perhaps understanding the level of family financial distress. Is it changing in our area? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? If you take tables 10 and 11 together, you'd probably have, you know, it'd be strongly suggested that things uh, uh, for a, a segment of our society uh, have, uh, have uh, deteriorated. Number 12. Now, I must point out that this does not include the Wausau area. The data we thought we were going to get uh, in time to include in tonight's presentation did not come in on time, so we couldn't get the Wausau info in. I, I apologize for that. So this basically covers um, Portage and uh, Wood Counties. And one of the things here, these numbers seem to be rather low. They are low because over the past several years, there's been a very a substantial decline in the amount of residential construction taking place. Uh, these numbers are quite a bit lower than, than what they were. And even from last year, we're starting to see uh, some declines. As a matter of fact, I uh, have uh, made note of the fact that uh, we might have some leveling off uh, taking place in the, uh, in, the, in the area because the percentage declines are not quite as uh, severe as what they were in past periods. Now, look at the residential alteration activity, and here you can see that we do see some bump ups in activity taking place, suggesting that individuals are uh, still making alterations uh, to their homes, perhaps rather than, than buying them. 
uh, buying uh, some uh, new, uh, a new uh, place. Uh, once again, same uh, caveat as the last table. This data does not include the Wausau area, unfortunately. And these are non-residential construction. Uh, uh, these are business, primarily business and government types of projects happening in those uh, counties. And I don't give percentage changes because these tend to be very large singular events that swing the percentages violently up or down depending. But I just you know, present these so that we can get some feel as to what has transpired. And you can see the numbers here as easy as I can. I will not bother to read them to you. But at the levels of activity uh, taking place in non-residential construction activity in the Stevens Point uh, Plover area. Now, uh, let's just see here. Well, I, if I go forward, no, why don't we go all the way back? And I'll put my lead page up just to have something up there. There you go. Um, Clearly, our economy is part of the state economy. I mean, that's, 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 that's obvious and part of the national economy. And we're also part of the global economy. And uh, we are affected by things that are happening, as, uh, as Mike and Lee uh, have already indicated. I thought it might be uh, interesting to take a look at some of the data as it pertains to Wausau in terms of what are the things that we export to the rest of the world? In other words, I want to get across the point that even here in central Wisconsin, we are connected to the, the, uh, the greater you know, global economy. And if we are, what are those activities? What are those things that we you know, ship to other parts of the world? In the Wausau metro area, which is basically all of Marathon County, some of the, some of the big ones, some of the, the, the largest ones would be paper, still to this day and age. Paper is, uh, is the largest thing that we ship uh, to the rest of the world. And by the way, our largest trading partners are Mexico and Canada, if you want to know that. Uh, machinery is another big one about, uh, oh, let's see, uh, approximately $46 million worth of machinery shipped out of the area. Paper, just to put that in perspective, is about $55 million. Electrical equipment is another big one. You all know that we have some major electrical equipment manufacturers in the area. About $33 million worth of shipments. Um, wood products, which would include a whole variety of different things, around $12 million. And, um, Various food and kindred products. I mean, obviously, we know because you, you see the factories around here that we do uh, produce a lot of, of uh, uh, various uh, products in, in the food line. So that would be uh, another big uh, component of what we do export from the local area. So um, there are a lot of jobs uh, that are associated with those, uh, ex with those exporting numbers. And uh, clearly, uh, exporting is important to our local economy. Uh, oftentimes we hear just the negative aspect of that and we talk about you know the job destruction but as was suggested by earlier talks and what I have shown there there is this, this transformation process that happens and and there uh, the economy does uh, reallocate uh, uh, its economic resources to uh, you know other productive uses and also too to get across the idea that gee if you think about these companies that are behind these numbers, and, and most of you probably can guess what a lot of these, what, what the, who these companies you know, might be. Uh, we have a lot of employment that is tied uh, to, to exporting activity. So we do have a vested interest in this area when it comes to uh, maintaining uh, trade relationships with the rest of the world. So uh, on that note, I'm going to uh, conclude. And once again, I want to thank everyone for, for having me here today. Thank you. thank you. We have a few minutes to answer your questions, if there is any. Are there any questions? Jim? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think it was Lee Hansen who uh, made the comment with regard to uh, tariffs and 
quota. the remark that tariffs and quotas were not thought very highly of by economists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my question is for Lee or for anyone who wants to respond to it. Um, rather than thinking strictly in terms of uh, tariff restriction, uh, what is your opinion of uh, the uh, effort to uh, enter into agreements which try to uh, attempt to ensure what I think is sometimes called fair trade rather than free trade. That is to say, dealing with some of the working conditions in, in the areas with, with, with uh, whom we trade. I think this is a good question for Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to. <laughs> I was going to ask who's guarding the cookies and punch. but. <laughs> Uh, fair trade, you know, that, that's an interesting concept, and it's, it's pretty complicated to think through, and I, I think it boils down to how much we want to try to take the initiative to get trading partners to address some issues in their economy that we attach just moral value to. And it is a little bit complicated to think, um, you know, poor countries are poor for a reason. They, they tend not to have really educated workforce, not a lot of infrastructure, and there are points in a country's life cycle when the citizenry may deem jobs and income more important than environmental protection and child labor laws. And we were certainly at that point in our development a century ago. People worked at very young ages. You know, we, we don't see that now, and we think, oh, how inhumane that you know, young children are working in some poor countries, but in fact, uh, sometimes the best thing for a country like that is to just have the opportunity for free trade, forget about fair trade, to earn income by exporting to the United States and gradually work their way up to where they have high enough income to invest more in education and skills and develop naturally the way we did. But I think you can make a case, you know, I certainly, the thing I lose the most sleep about is environmental degradation. I think trying to force more rapid change on China and India as they're developing to do so in a way that's more environmentally friendly than the way we developed is probably pretty important. Um, so, you know, there's the economic side of me that wants to, you know, and maybe a little libertarian streak that says it's none of our business, you know, free trade's a good thing and they'll manage their country. I think there are a lot of externalities that aren't managed by the market system and probably were wise to try to advance the environmental standards at least. Uh, but I'm, some of the other things like child labor, I, I think we should let other cultures make their decisions the way we made ours. But do we have a definition for fair trade? I mean, that's a complicated, yeah, there is I, no well-defined. I just take know, it as are we going to try to meddle in their labor standards and environmental standards, for example. I think those are the two big issues. And, environmental standards, I think there's a stronger case. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, this question goes to Mr. Knetter. Uh, sir, do you find that the current economic situation in the state of Wisconsin will create an environment where uh, students may be less likely to attend uh, business schools or find them as more of a sanctuary to avoid um, uh, getting into a market that's a bit risky now, but perhaps will increase uh, in its efficiency later. Yeah, bad business climate is a boom time for my industry. I, I can just say unequivocally, we'll see applications to our MBA program go up this year. And I think it is a time when, you know, rational people will, you know, th there are more people who might have lost a job recently who are in their mid-20s and think, okay, it's a good time to go back for two years, invest in my future, because I think most people, you know, if, if they have the capacity to finance it, I think that's the one thing that's changed a lot. So a lot of people, a lot of working professionals who would come and get an evening MBA or a weekend MBA at UW-Madison will have a harder time using, for example, home equity loans to finance that kind of thing. So I, we'll see how it plays out from a cost standpoint, but I think a lot of people will desire to go back, not just to business school, but maybe uh, pursue more schooling generally. So I, I think that's a good thing um, to do at this time. 
just as a, an, an anecdotal thing, and I mean, it, it is anecdotal. Uh, I was talking to a, a student um, just yesterday, one of my student advisees, and uh, they said, you know, I think this might be a good time for me to pursue an MBA. And I said, why? And he, well, he said, well, I think that the job market's going to be really lousy. So once again, it's anecdotal. It's one case, but, you know, the, the plural of anecdotal is data. And uh, I think a lot of that's going on. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just recently suggesting that uh, applications were up. In, uh, in in graduate programs uh, throughout the country, so it, it's it's generally good for graduate education. Historically, I know that I took advantage of that opportunity. I happened to graduate at a very uh, bad time back in the bad old 1970s, and went in the middle of a very severe recession. And one of the things that I did was, oh, I think I might go to graduate school <laughs> uh, because there were really not very good prospects. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the job market. Anyway. That's a great point. Yeah, I was a PhD born of desperation, came out in the 1982-83 recession. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm. Yes. I was just wondering where you see the push come for the change that you foresee being, or you see as being needed in our education? The push. <clears throat> that, that's a hard <clears throat> question to answer. There have been, you know, piles of reports coming out about the need for higher skilled labor force, better educated labor force. And uh, I think there's general agreement that that's what we should have, but Mobilizing the finances and getting some kind of commitment is very difficult. Plus, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that we really don't know how to do. And even though there has been a lot of research on schools and school quality, charter schools, et cetera, there's enough noise out there in all of these findings so that it's not clear exactly what the road to salvation is. Uh, if you have kids, you see it in your own kids. Uh, you know, they go off in all different directions, even though presumably you're providing good guidance to them. So, uh, you know, Chuck Knapp and all of these people and uh, a lot of notables have been pushing on this, but again, you could probably find the stack of this, these reports two or three feet high going back to a nation at risk back in 1984, the Reagan report. And we've had national goals set for reading standards, et cetera. And the 1984 report set goals for what was in 1994. Well, we did not meet those. You then pushed them back to 2000. You pushed them back to 2008. So um, I'm not very hopeful, frankly. You know, I think one of the most interesting things about, and the reason I think it's hard to get urgency on that question is We've been hearing for a long, long time about where we stand in test scores, you know, comparing across countries, and also where we are in terms of our national saving rate. So it's not only that our, you know, high school students at graduation test much more poorly than a lot of their counterparts in other developed economies, but we've been hearing for 40 years probably that our savings rate is too low compared to Japan and Germany. And yet you look at the last 20 year period, I mean, and you saw the charts, we have dramatically outperformed their economies. And you ask yourself, well, how can that be? How can that possibly happen? And to me, it's the five things that I'd listed on my chart. It's that we really do reward innovation. We have flexible labor markets. We have broad and deep capital markets. And so people have an incentive to go out and be creative. And it's not that everybody has to be the best engineer or the best, you know, whatever, you need enough people to get those skills who can lead the development and creation of companies that other people can fit into. And I think where our biggest problem is is that we're leaving far too many children behind in the inner city, and I hope that that's something we do something about. Um, higher education, as far as I'm concerned, is kind of a mess. It's this hodgepodge of public universities and private universities and 
nobody can really be the governor of all that because we've got so many private schools in the mix. So it's hard to reconfigure that. I think there's some efficiency gains we could reap, but I, I don't see that happening. I hope we can get some energy mm -hmm. around improving early education for poor young children in this country. I think that's a real tragedy. One more. I'm glad you mentioned the innovation. I think that, that a lot of the testing, um, being a retired ele elementary teacher, I've watched the education critic um, scores and so on. And I think it's been comparing apples to oranges. And, and so I, I uh, bristle when I hear how poorly we've done. And that we can't keep innovation going, the creativity, cannot be tested with no child left behind style. So, um, and we, uh, I spent some time in Japan and know that they respected their teachers and they paid their teachers. So uh, what's the goal? Is our goal to have high productivity of what? Um, I mm -hmm. think that's yeah. what's not coagulating here. That's not really a question, but <laughs> I'd Comments. like your reaction. <coughs> Any other questions? One more. I, I, I agree with what you said. So if you wanted a reaction, I, I personally think, uh, you know, the Japanese, uh, you know, the Singaporeans, they come over. I mean, they, they get these high test scores, but they wonder how come people aren't more creative with all this knowledge. And, you know, what we find is that, yeah, they're good at rote learning and book learning and mm -hmm studying something, but they're not good at creating and thinking outside the box and taking the next step. And that's what our system tends to do a better job of creating is interaction, collaboration, creativity, and that isn't measured in a test score uh, of the type that kids are taking. So I think that's a big part of why we do well. Um. Is there anything good can come from this recession, like uh, decreasing our waste, our greed, decreasing our greed, or making us less materialistic, or maybe making us more creative? All of those things. I think, you know, that, that, that is, you know, it's a great observation. I think people are too obsessed with material things. Uh, we've glorified that way too much. You know, hopefully being thrifty will, and, and smart will come back into fashion and we'll see some leadership among people in industry who say, you know, I don't need to be paid this much, uh, it's, it's enough. And, you know, we'll see if that happens. But, um, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of what's happened in the last 20 years is a lot of the wealth creation in the country did occur in newly formed companies like the Microsofts, Oracles, Googles, et cetera. And when that happens, you know, one thing you realize when you really look at this process, the people who amass major wealth are the founders of companies. They're not, you know, I mean, Jack Welch is really exorbitantly paid, okay? He doesn't make anywhere near what Bill Gates makes, right? And, and this gets played out in a lot of, you know, it's not just those two. But what happened is there were so many founders and so many new companies in the 90s where young founders in particular made you know, enormous sums of wealth by creating a new company that I think there was a lot of envy created in traditional large going concerns where CEOs started saying, well, how come this guy who's a nobody you know, is worth a billion dollars and I'm just getting paid 10 million a year? Well, we look at that and think, Ten million a year? What? What's the problem? You know, what are you complaining about? But there's just this natural feeling, and that pushes up, you know, what the benchmarks are. And I really believe that's a big part of what happened. Is there was this burst of creativity, a lot of wealth creation, and then you get, you know, the normal envy that sets in in people, and that drove executive comp, you know, through all kinds of companies where, frankly, it shouldn't be that high because you didn't build the company; you're just running it. There's a lot of other people that could run it. And they'd probably run it for nine million, not ten, and they'd do just as good a job. And then somebody else would run it for eight. But it's not really a competitive market, you know. It's it's a pretty kind of 
odd market for CEOs. So I think that should correct itself. Yes, they would. Or less than that. Well, actually, you know, the truth is, though, the Russians and the Chinese, they have some exorbitantly wealthy <laughs> people. It, it, it may be even more skewed there, actually. It just isn't publicized in the same way. But um, I think all those things will happen. And there, there is a lot of good that comes in a recession because, you know, people look for ways to save and become thrifty and we re rebalance. So mm -hmm. I think things will, will get better, but it'll take a while. Mm -hmm. Randy and Lee were right about that. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Cookies and punch. Thank you. This was great. Meeting you.